All of us grow up in particular realities. A home, a family, a clan, a small town, a neighborhood. Depending upon how we're brought up, we are either deeply aware of the particular reading of reality into which we are born, or we are peripherally aware of it. Whichever is the case, it's pretty easy to pick up on changes when you live in a small town, as is the case in tonight's story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so I could read the stories that you send to me directly back to you. So, my dear friends, once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. The people of Thornridge Falls don't like discussing what happened that summer, and I don't blame them. Small towns like that are small for a reason. Nobody wants to visit them. At least, nobody who has heard of more prominent places like New York City, London, Tokyo or Mumbai. The only tourists coming through a town like Thornridge Falls are people who want more of a regional or even local experience. Thornridge Falls is about as small town as you can get. And I mean it. I don't think the town's population ever reached 8,000 people. That brings with it quite a few benefits, like low crime, and being a quite wealthy town, the local public schools could rival anything a private school could offer. Unfortunately, even small towns can have horrifying events that put them on the map. The Ruby Ridge incident happened near Maples, Idaho. Her Baumeister killed gay men in and around Westfield, Indiana. The Mothman terrorized Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And... As for the town of Thornridge Falls, it was called the Distemper. I remember it very well. I grew up in Thornridge Falls. And when it came time for college, I would return to Thornridge Falls for breaks, though, to be honest, there's not much to do, as is typical for a small town. Being home for summer was somewhat of a bizarre experience, as far as I could see. It's hard to see what changes and what doesn't when you've been gone for a while. The first change I noticed was that my high school had bought some land to use to expand the athletic fields. I didn't really find it especially offensive, and after all, they kind of needed it. Not that I'm one to care about track and field. I'm more of a weightlifting person. I won Olympic gold at the age of 17, actually. That didn't keep Dad from babbling about football the entire car ride home. I still can't believe they managed to have something that nice. Could you imagine how a touchdown would look on it? Seriously, Dad? That's what you're saying in front of an Olympic weightlifter? No, it really could be gorgeous. I hear the school even bought new footballs. I wanted to slap Dad so badly for that. I never understood how he could just pretend I never said something. Well, on the bright side, that was something that didn't change. There's something about the annoyance of family that provides a measure of comfort. At one point, when we were moving me out of the dorm room, he asked me why my trash can looked like it had gills. Even though it wasn't remotely designed like that. And then we returned home. It took only a few minutes to have me settle back into my old room, which also remained unchanged. And for a while, all I could do was just flop down on my bed, unable to move with how sweaty and overheated I was. When it finally dissipated, I sat up and looked around my room for a while, at many of the things I had in it. Something I liked to do even then. After lying on my bed for a while, I stood up. There were dozens of paintings all over my walls. I'd always liked to paint and write poetry. And even now I put poetry into my paintings. Hard for someone who won Olympic gold, I know. I even tried out for the Olympic judo team. But I had to pick between judo and weightlifting. So I chose to serve on the weightlifting team. People always seem to be stunned when they learn that. Weightlifting and poetry don't seem to go together in most people's minds. Not that I care. The fact that it hits people over the head doesn't matter to me, and it didn't matter to me then either. I just wanted to check out what was still on my walls. The first painting that I examined was a personal favourite. 
a painting depicting an alley with a homeless person sleeping in a tent. It's just how well I managed to make it look so realistic. And also, how well I hid the poem in the painting. It takes a moment to see, but it's there. It's right next to the man on the wall. Another personal favourite was sat right next to it. That one was of a dark fantasy piece that made it painfully obvious that I like horror. I've always been a fan of H.B. Lovecraft, and if you're a fan of him too, you'd recognise what I painted as the Nyarlathotep, and inserted in the painting the quote, As a foulness shall we know them. Their hand is at your throat, and yet ye see them not. Something a fan would totally understand. There were other things as well, but there were more things on my walls than just paintings I'd done. There were Chinese wall hangings and Western calligraphy pieces as well. In fact, there was a small calligraphy piece right between those two paintings, which I got when I was in China for a study abroad program. As I examined it, I noticed something. The frame looked a bit distorted, as if someone had thrown it against the wall and then had a professional repair it. I just stared at it, and then sighed when I realised that someone needed to be asked a few questions. As soon as that crossed my mind, though, I suddenly became aware of an enormous amount of loud shouting. I immediately went to get a better listen, only to hear a man yell, I wish your mother aborted you. I rushed to my window and I immediately saw it. My parents were involved in a heated argument with our next-door neighbour. The man was still yelling insults at my parents, who were trying to ask him why he was yelling so much. All I could do was stare. This was our next-door neighbour. The same guy who had once done CPR on my mother when she stopped breathing after a seizure, and got us out of the house when our house caught fire. What happened next made me jump. The next-door neighbour punched my mother squarely in the nose. Mum was in such a shock for a moment, she just laid there on the ground. Hey, what the frick is wrong with you? My father shouted. Then he knelt down to help Mum. Get up. Get up, honey. Can you hear me? My hands were twitching into fists as Mum just lay there on the ground. Several moments passed. Then... She started moving. She removed her hand from her nose and blood poured out onto her face. The bleeding got so bad it dripped onto the grass below her. Out of nowhere, the neighbour jumped over the fence and straddled her as he repeatedly punched her over and over. The neighbour's wife immediately began to scream as the neighbour slammed his fist into Mum's cheeks, eyes, jaw and forehead. It didn't take long for Mum's skin to turn red. The next thing anyone knew, the neighbour had straddled Mum and began choking her. Dad grabbed him into a chokehold as hard as he could, but no matter how hard he squeezed, the neighbour wouldn't stop. Meanwhile, the neighbour's wife was screaming and crying for him to stop what he was doing. Dad squeezed harder than anyone would expect from a man of his size, and then, when he realised he wasn't succeeding in that, dropped and started trying to pry his hands off of Mum's neck. I grabbed my phone and called the police and an ambulance. It took them barely three minutes to arrive. All the while, I made sure to have my phone recording it on video. And, as soon as they arrived, they immediately pulled their tasers out and their pepper spray. The pepper spray got their neighbour to focus on them instead of mum. But then, he charged them. They used their pepper spray on him again. Put it on my sandwich, you sons of bitches, the neighbour shouted, and he charged again. One of the police officers then pulled out his taser and fired. Right away, the neighbour flopped down on the ground and started flailing like a fish desperate to get oxygen. The neighbour screamed like a dying bear, but it disabled him well enough for the cops to handcuff him and throw him in the back of the police car. Not long after, an ambulance arrived and I rushed downstairs, the camera on my phone still rolling. Phoebe, are you okay? Dad yelled. I'm fine, Dad. I was in my room, watching. Are you the one who called? A police officer asked. 
I nodded as I looked at Mum and saw just how bad she was. I started tearing up. Both her eye sockets looked swollen. Her lower jaw was red and the skin over her cheekbones was blue. Before long, the ambulance drove off and the neighbour was taken to the local jail. Dad and I followed the ambulance to the hospital. It took a while for the doctors to emerge and tell us what was going on. It turned out the neighbour had done a real number on Mum's face. Both eye sockets and both cheekbones were broken in multiple places. She was definitely going to need surgery to fix it. At least she was going to make it. I still don't know how only her eye sockets and cheekbones were the only busted bones in her face, but, well, you take what you can get in a situation like this. And the local news took no time in finding out what had happened. I don't know if you've ever had local reporters swarm your doorstep, but let me tell you something. It's a very unpleasant experience. It might as well have been a swarm of hummingbirds darting around and trying to peck my face off. And I'm not just talking about for a couple of hours. This kept going on for days. I had to take to sneaking in via shortcuts that the journalists didn't know about so I could avoid them. And it wasn't just the fact that they swarmed us and our neighbours so quickly and for so long. They actually broke out into fistfights over it. I was standing in my bedroom window watching when a fistfight between journalists forced police to become involved. The one journalist squeezed so hard the other journalist's face was turning purple. Not that it bothered me too much. Seeing people you've had harassing you like tomorrow will never come, being arrested is hardly satisfying. I snickered as they fought for a moment, but stopped when I realised I'd forgotten I was recording it on my phone. All the while, I was keeping my college friends posted on the situation via social media. There were a lot of comments that fell into the general category of how unbelievable it was. After all, how many times do you see reporters having fistfights with each other? Others just asked if I was okay and if I needed anything. I said I was fine and didn't need anything at the moment, but would keep everyone updated. And then there were the dumb jokes and puns. You know the type. The sort of puns that make you groan and laugh at the same time. And the jokes that do the same thing. It was just pretty stupid stuff that my friends and I were all known for doing. One friend said that she just found out she's colorblind, and that the diagnosis had come completely out of the purple. And with that, I really wanted to slap her. God, that one really made me groan. But then, one of my friends made a really strange comment. Um, Phoebe, why are the eyes of those journalists glowing black? That gave me pause. Glowing black eyes. What was she talking about? I didn't notice any glowing black eyes in any of the videos I'd taken. I immediately asked her what she was referring to. And she told me to go to the moment when one of the journalists was placed in the back of the squad car. I did so. I gave a small gasp when I saw it. The journalists were looking right at me. And they really were glowing black. My hand went to my mouth. But then I took a closer look at the eyes. And I noticed something. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what it was. But I was proficient enough in terms of my film software. I was able to zoom in on the eyes. Much to my surprise, they seemed iridescent. Iridescent black is rarely something you see. They reminded me of black opals for some reason, and yet, there seemed to be something moving underneath. Almost like parasitic worms were squirming underneath skin. I posted the image to social media, and the effect was almost instantaneous. My friends spread it to others on their social media, and people from other countries I had to look up on a map to find out where they were precisely, were telling me how creepy it was. There were comments about how the eyes reminded them of the black-eyed children phenomenon. But then, someone from Thailand told me something. He'd been in his own hometown when something similar had begun. And it began with the same kind of events. 
by way of someone attacking another person. For a moment, all I could do was stare at the screen. I didn't know at the time what it meant. All I knew was that it was something strange that had happened, and I had captured it on my phone for my friends to see on social media. What are you talking about? I asked. Oh, believe you me, you'll find out soon enough. That was all he would say, even after I inquired for more details. About a week later, the incident between my parents and our neighbour was still a talking point in town. The journalists had finally started to calm down. People still joked about it with me in line at the grocery store or in restaurants. And Mum had been released from the hospital. The surgeons had had to use quite a bit of titanium to fix the broken bones in her face. But because her jaw was still okay, she could at least eat on her own. With Dad away on business, we were able to eat at a Chinese restaurant within walking distance of our house. For some reason, Dad never liked Chinese food so not having him around meant we could eat there to celebrate. It was a pretty nice night, and we were joking with the people at the next table about what had happened between us and our neighbour. One of the people at the table next to us noted that she'd heard the neighbour's wife was thinking of divorcing him. That in turn made me note that behind every angry woman is a man who has no clue what the hell he did wrong. We all snickered for a moment. When, all of a sudden, there was an enormous crash. Everyone in the room turned to see what was going on. And when we saw what was happening, time almost seemed to stop. All I could do was take out my phone to film it. A woman had smashed her plate against the wall. By the time I got my phone's video ready, she'd gripped a server by the throat and started punching her. The sounds of the bones in the server's face cracking echo throughout the entire restaurant. Even cooks in the kitchen heard and walked into the dining area to see what was going on. It took six grown men to pull her away. And even then, the police called to the scene had to use their taser and pepper spray. Afterwards, the air stank of what had just taken place. Children were whimpering after having witnessed what had happened. As we left, I let the video on my phone capture the woman on camera. The woman looked directly at me as we passed her. I couldn't help but inhale sharply. It made my mum ask if I was okay. The woman's eyes were burning an opalescent black. The black was blacker than hell's heart. That, as it turned out, was all it took. Two days after that, there was another attack. I wasn't physically there for that one, but it didn't take long for me and most everyone else in town to learn what had happened. A husband and wife were arrested after attacking the mother and aunt of the girl who wouldn't let their daughter steal her phone. I would have dismissed it as a story of entitled parents and their entitled child, but when I saw the footage from the body cams the police were using, well, I saw the parents' eyes were glowing black. Thornridge Falls barely had enough time to blink before, the very next day, a child at a local playground beat up another child. The footage captured at the scene showed that the attacking child had glowing black eyes. I shivered at the sight, and at the thought of a child doing that. Even the psychiatrists at the hospital couldn't understand it. That was, reportedly, the first time that child was ever violent. The attacks and glowing eyes continued every single day for two weeks. The videos kept coming as well. Not every attack was captured on video, but it didn't matter. Everyone knew the attacks all featured someone with glowing black eyes when the attacker did it. The hospital was quickly overwhelmed with victims. I witnessed quite a few of them myself, and captured a few more on camera too. I didn't think it would happen in front of me, but let me tell you something. There's nothing like having a trio of children with black eyes trying to attack you to make you shiver for several days. That was hardly a one-off, 
I was at a grocery store when a worker attacked a customer after he had asked a question. The customer's blood must have spewed out of him for over a minute, or at least that's how it seemed. Then there was one when I was at a local gas station. It had several pumps and thus several islands where people could pump gas as needed. I'd been pumping gas when, all of a sudden, an attack began. A woman with glowing black eyes poured gasoline on the man at the pump next to her, and then she took a lighter and set him on fire. All I could do was stare at what was happening in front of me. The skin bubbled with how hot the flames became, and the skin melted away to the bone. Eventually, I could see the woman's trachea. That was the first fatality. I still have nightmares about it. The beatings and attacks continued happening for three more weeks, and twelve more people died, mostly from gunshot wounds. But then, after that, there was a reprieve. For three days, there were no attacks. Everyone felt a little bewildered, and people held their breath wondering about it. The first day, without any attacks, hit the news like crazy. On the second day, it was all the local news could talk about. I even posted about it on social media. Many people expressed hope that it was all over. All I could admit was that I hoped so too. But then, that same man from Thailand gave me a warning. This was far from the end. I just stared at the screen wondering what he meant. And in that moment, I decided I needed to have answers from him. He'd already told me this would be far from the end once. I just couldn't let it slide a second time. How far is this from the end? I asked. You will see, he replied. No, I need to know what's going to happen next. I said, you will see. No, I need to know. Don't even think about blocking me. I can easily create account after account to get answers from you. Now, tell me what's going on. Yes, this was an asshole move. I'll admit as much. But at least he begrudgingly agreed to tell me so I could prepare myself for it. It all started with a family, not terribly different from mine. A kid coming home from college only to witness his next-door neighbor assault his father. And then, everything started on. At first, it was just beating each other up, causing the police to become swamped. Dozens of people were attacked. Local transgender people were particularly attacked, and the most popular method of attacking people was with traditional Thai swords. And then, it was over. Nothing happened with regards to people attacking others. But, as it turned out, it was just a precursor. The man said, This is why you need to look out, starting tomorrow. My heart pounded as soon as he said that. The man continued, There would be, rather than a rash of violence towards others, violence towards self. In other words, suicides would skyrocket for days on end. There were multiple suicides that happened in the man's town and surrounding area, one of the more memorable ones being the teenager who slit her own throat. Then, it would culminate in a giant event. There would be a major disaster. And after that, there would be nothing unusual. I tried pressing him for what had happened in his town, but he wouldn't say. I didn't press him too hard, though, because, well, it didn't particularly matter. That was a lot to take in, I must admit. But as I would come to find out, it was true. I woke up the next morning and turned on the TV to learn that three people in town were found dead from throwing themselves off nearby cliffs in the night in the local nature preserve. They'd been found that morning by local park rangers, their coagulated blood still dripping onto the rocks below. Not two days later, four more people had been found dead by suicide. The ways they did so were different and changed based on the person. One killed himself by swallowing cyanide. 
another killed herself via carbon monoxide. The methods didn't matter. The relevant part was they killed themselves. The suicides just kept on coming and coming. There were dozens of them, and dozens of ways in which people did so. Throwing themselves off of cliffs or shooting themselves in the head were far from the only ways in which people dispatched themselves. Some blew themselves up with pipe bombs strapped to their bodies. Others overdosed on prescription drugs. Some even lit themselves on fire. The suicide that sticks with me most is the woman who cut off her lower legs and let herself bleed out in her own home. Her children were the ones who found her. And they also watched as she died. There's no way they haven't been psychologically wounded in some form. If you ask me, it's selfish enough to take your own life. Making sure your children will find you like that, even more so. It was pretty much insanity. There was no rhyme or reason for it. And everyone seemed to be at risk. It didn't matter who. A local doctor, known for being on the take and illegally providing opiates for addicts, blew himself up in a field with pipe bombs. The very next day, the biggest lawyer in town, who'd taken on the likes of DuPont and Purdue Farmer, burned himself to death. Then, there was someone on my street. It was the sister of the latest high school class's valedictorian. I was returning home from taking some photos when I found her. She was walking around on the sidewalk, sobbing so loudly... I heard her before I saw her. Then, I turned the corner, only to see her waving a gun around. Hey, what's wrong? I asked as I rushed towards her. And then, I stopped dead in my tracks. Her eyes were burning black, just like they were when people were beating each other up. I tried getting the gun away from her. We must have fought so hard. I even took a graze wound to my arm. I didn't feel the pain until after the fight was over. But it didn't matter. Soon after getting that graze wound, she stuck the gun in her mouth and pulled the trigger right in front of me. For a long time, all I did was just sit there on my knees, sobbing. I don't know how long it actually was, but once I realized there was nothing I could do, I called for an ambulance and told them what had happened. The paramedics asked me if I needed an ambulance. But once they told me the wound was relatively minor, I insisted on driving myself home. All the while, tears flowing down my face. I remembered what that guy had said. Something was coming. And this time, I believed it. The only thing I didn't know was when it would happen. Too bad for me, it would be the same day I watched that girl shoot herself in the head. The doctors confirmed that it was just a minor graze wound. The only thing I needed was stitches. They told me how to keep it clean and to keep it from getting worse. As badly as I'd been crying, I still managed to crack a smile that showed I was at least physically going to be okay. I just walked right out of the hospital and back into the parking lot. I climbed into my car and started fumbling around for my keys when, all of a sudden, I noticed something. There appeared to be smoke pouring out of the hospital roof. Flames began appearing. The strange part was they didn't appear to be all that big. They were largely confined to the roof of the building. I stared at it for a moment, and it didn't take long for them to reach the front. I reached for my phone to call emergency services, but before I could even touch it, I heard a loud explosion. I looked up just in time to see the entire building rip apart. It reminded me of watching those videos in slow motion of water balloons ripping apart when they pop. Debris went every which way I could see. Brick, concrete, metal and glass went flying. Cars were destroyed. Drivers crashed trying to avoid debris that was landing in the street. I had to duck and cover when the debris cracked my windshield. And then came the screaming. The air filled with dozens of people screaming and crying, to the point where it almost reminded me of a swarm of bees attempting to fend off an attacking bear. The air stank with smoke, broken asphalt and gasoline. 
I got out of the car to look around. And then I gasped as I saw the entrance road to the hospital. Debris from the broken hospital building had landed right on it, effectively blocking it off. 142 people died that day. Clearly I wasn't one of them. I wasn't even hurt, aside from my initial stitched-up graze wound. I couldn't sleep for days, though. I could have been in that hospital when it exploded. Eventually, I was able to sleep again. But the details surrounding everything else that happened after the hospital exploded are fuzzy at best. I can't even remember how I managed to get out of the parking lot, much less the immediate sensation that happened in the immediate aftermath. A few weeks later, I returned to school. As was proven to be true, the hospital's explosion was the last thing that happened. No more deaths or attacks or anything else out of the ordinary took place. My friends were glad to see that I was okay. What must have been dozens of people stopped me, asking what I had witnessed. It didn't take long for me to not want to leave my dorm room for fear of someone stopping me, begging me for details. Eventually, I took to walking very quickly and with determination to get where I needed to be. The hospital was rebuilt shortly after it exploded. It looked almost exactly the same, but for the memorial on the front. I make a point not to visit. I didn't even attend the memorial dedication ceremony, for that matter. I have seen photos of the memorial, though. It lists all the names of those who died in the explosion and the aftermath. Needless to say, all of these events put Thornridge Falls on the map in the annals of matters that are creepy or horrifying. The sort of thing that we all like to think about for cheap thrills. Nobody knows what to make of it. Not even the citizens of Thornridge Falls. Nor has anyone been able to solve the mystery of what happened, or what was behind it. Everyone seems to have their own speculations, of course. Aliens. The government and the Illuminati all seem to get mentioned at some point. As for me, I have never been able to know what to make of it. I recently got in touch with that Thai man again, though. It's been a while since we last spoke, but we found ourselves talking again. We both discussed what had happened in our hometowns, and what had happened to each other. You are okay, right? he asked. Physically... Yes, I just hope nothing like that ever happens again. For a moment, he went silent, though I could see that he was still typing. About that. That's actually why I contacted you now. It's happening again, in a rural town in Spain. Ninety-four people are already dead of suicide. That made me shiver, but he wasn't done. But there's something else. It's the first time they've been noticed. There are people in military-style uniforms nearby. And their eyes are all glowing black as hell's heart. Hope you enjoyed that one. Another fantastic tale there, sent directly to me so I could read it all for you. Interesting one, well, I thought. Yeah, well, <laughs> let me know what you think in the comment section below the video. And of course, special shout out, as ever, to those of you working the night shift, you, those of you driving the long haul. I know it can't be easy. I used to do those kind of things myself when I was younger. And, well, whatever gets us through the night, I hope this certainly helps you do that. Okay, back again on Wednesday. Until then. Sweet dreams and bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?